Chapter 37, Second Year, Exams May 1973 Exam season began at the worst possible time for Remus, around mid-May, right when the full moon was due. The moon itself fell on a Friday, which meant he was able to attend his potions test that morning, but he lost the whole weekend to sleep, when he would have really preferred to revise. More than that, the moon had thrown off his magic completely. He'd thought it was happening less in his second year, but as their exams got closer, whether it was nerves or the lengthening days, Remus found his magic growing stronger, wilder and harder to control. The slightest one movement caused the most fantastic results, and sometimes he'd barely finished speaking the incantation before light was bursting from its tip, making his fingers tingle with shock. James had taken to saying, Calm down, Mooney, at least three or four times a day, as Remus attempted to practice various basic transfigurative spells and charms, which inevitably went too far. He'd thought that just by doing some simple incantations, that might help him gain some control. But this was apparently not the case, as he smashed the dorm room window a third time, attempting to levitate his gobstone set. Reparo, Sirius muttered, glancing over the top of his astronomy revision. The window fixed itself at once. Remus sighed. You really need to relax, mate, James grinned. We don't have any practical exams until next week anyway. I'm so behind, though, Remus grumbled, collecting up his gobstones and putting them back in their box. If you're behind, then what am I? Peter wailed from the floor, where he had five texts spread out in front of him, all different subjects. I know I'm going to fail for transfiguration. My rabbit hasn't changed at all this year, and I know she's going to make us do something really hard. At least you're good at potions, Remus shot back. And herbology. I can't even remember which leaves mean what. You beat me on our last herbology quiz, James reminded him. And you've got us all by the bollocks when it comes to history of magic. I've been copying your homework all year. But you're the best at transfig... Remus started, but was interrupted by a loud thump as Sirius threw his astronomy book on the floor. Will you all shut up? I'm trying to revise, he yelled, standing up. Like a bunch of old women nattering. I'm going to the library. He pulled his satchel over his shoulder and stormed out of the room. They sat in silence for a little while, Peter gnawing his lip, looking on the verge of tears. James sighed. Ignore him. He's just in a mood because he has to go home soon. Not that I blame him, he added quickly. Parents like that and all. Spose, Rumor shrugged, though he didn't think it was a good enough excuse, really. It wasn't as if he, Remus, was much looking forward to the summer holidays either. All right, fine. He didn't have to marry his cousin or attend weird stuffy banquets. But nor did Sirius have to be locked up in a cell once a month or hide from much older, rougher boys whose greatest delight was shoving your head in the bogs. He's not staying with you again then, James? Peter asked nervously, probably quite looking forward to a serious free summer, as it meant he would have James all to himself. Nah, James replied, sounding much less cheerful at the prospect. He's got an open invite, obviously. You all have, he eyed Remus. But we don't reckon it'll happen after the fiasco at Christmas. He thinks he'll be locked up completely until the betrothal ceremony. Remus felt a pang of guilt in his chest. He still hadn't come up with a workable solution to that, and between revision and the full moon, he hadn't even thought about it properly in two weeks. Judging by Narcissa's behaviour in the halls, hexing anyone who so much as looked at her sideways, she had not fared much better. Well, if he keeps acting the way he does, he'll lose more than his hair next time, Peter said, primly, sorting through his notes. What do you mean? James frowned, sitting up. Saying it's all his fault? No, Peter looked alarmed at James's tone. No, I, I just mean, well, you, you know the other day he packed all of those Gryffindor house banners in his trunk. He wants to put them up in his bedroom to annoy his parents. 
Stuff like that is exactly what gets him in trouble. Nothing wrong with a bit of house pride, James sniffed defensively, though he shot a nervous glance at Sirius's trunk. Remus didn't get involved. Personally, he agreed with Peter and Narcissa. Sirius was his own worst enemy, a lot of the time. For someone so intelligent and magically gifted, he completely lacked subtlety, or even forethought. If he didn't have to mouth off at every opportunity, then maybe he wouldn't have found himself engaged at the age of 13. Remus knew better than anyone the importance of keeping low profile, especially when you were different from everyone around you. James, who was more like Sirius than Peter or Remus, wholeheartedly disagreed. In his mind, the most important thing was to always fight back. But if everything was a battle, then inevitably someone had to lose. And until he was of age, that was going to be serious. Every time. Excellent, Mr Potter! McGonagall gushed uncharacteristically as James transformed his rabbits into a perfect pair of red velvet slippers with a fur trim. Remus took a deep breath, steadying himself for his own attempt. It was a week and a half since the full moon, and he was finally back in control, though his nerves still got the better of him sometimes. He watched Sirius lazily wave his own wand over his own rabbits, and they too transformed into a lovely pair of black wool booties. Peter's slippers still had ears and tail even after three attempts, and left droppings on the desk. When Remus took his turn, he closed his eyes first, feeling light-headed, before finally uttering the incantation. The slippers were not as neat as James and Sirius's, but they were wearable, and at least no longer had any leperine features, even if they stayed a dull brown colour. At least he knew he had done his very best on the theory paper. In fact, on all of his theory papers. He was satisfied that he'd remembered everything he needed to remember when it came to his best subjects and that he hadn't done too hideously in potions, herbology or astronomy. At the end of the Transfiguration's exam, McGonagall returned all of the rabbits to their original state and sent them hopping back to their hutch at the back of the room, ready for the next exam. She then began to hand out sheets of parchment that looked like blank timetables. "'You will be aware,' she said very formally, that in your third year you may choose a minimum of two additional subjects to take up to ordinary wizarding levels. Here are your application sheets. If you will please think very carefully, reviewing each subject's merits, then complete the form and return it to my office no later than the last day of term. The class began to murmur excitedly, and Remus looked down at his form, and the subjects listed there, with great trepidation. As they all filed out of the room, Peter immediately began to badger James to find out which subjects he would be taking, so that he could select the exact same ones. Muggle studies, Sirius said as they headed outside into the summer sunshine. Definitely going to take smuggle studies. Remus rolled his eyes. There was no surprise. If any subject was going to gain the general disapproval of the Black family, then there it was. Do you think Evans will take that? James scratched his chin. Sirius grinned. Doubt it, mate. She's muggle-born. You could impress her with your knowledge, though. Yeah, yeah. Maybe. James looked down thoughtfully. Are Are you going to take that, then, James? Peter asked anxiously. Do you think it'll be difficult? I suppose we could ask Remus for help. Are you taking it, Mooney? Nah, Remus shook his head. What's the point? You lot do it, though. Then maybe you can stop asking me about stuff. He secretly wished that there was a wizarding studies subject he could take so that he didn't have to feel quite so out of his depth all of the time. But he supposed that was the arrogance of wizards. Divination. That's like fortune-telling, right? James sat down on the grass, throwing off his robes. Sirius followed suit, rolling up his shirt sleeves. I think so. Crystal balls and tea leaves. Sounds like a right, Doss. Let's do that. 
All three of them scribbled onto their papers. Remus did not. He didn't like the idea of knowing the future. Whatever he had coming to him, he was sure it couldn't be good. He tapped his temple with his wand quickly and whispered, Lectincula magna, beginning to read through his options. Arithmacy, he murmured. Is that like arithmetic? Numbers, anyway, Sirius replied. Supposed to be really difficult. Care of magical creatures. Don't know about that, James snorted. Have you seen the teacher? He's got more scars than Mooney. Oi, Remus kicked his ankle. Care of magical creatures had actually sounded quite interesting to him. After all, he was sort of a magical creature himself. I think I'll do arithmancy, if you are, Sirius said, still reading his paper. Will it be really difficult? Peter worried. We'll help you, mate. Don't worry, James soothed. Anyway, there are better things about third year than extra homework. Hogsmeade. You go to Honeydukes three times a week, Remus replied, mulling over the possibility of ancient runes. Yeah, but Zonko's. Remus grinned at him. He was actually pretty excited about the Hogsmeade's trips. He'd never been to any of the protected wizarding areas other than Hogwarts, and he was sick of hearing about how great Diagon Alley was. He sighed and laid back, looking up at the clouds. He would think about his third-year subjects later. There was no hurry. For now, he wanted to enjoy the end of the exams and revel in the thought that they had still almost a full month before school ended. Oi, oi, Evans! James sat up suddenly. Remus sighed, inwardly. James had been acting more and more of an idiot where Lily was concerned, ever since the midnight feast. I am not a dog, Potter. Her voice echoed across the grounds. Don't yell at me like one. Hi, Sirius, Mary's voice now. Remus sat up, blinking. Marlene gave him a shy wave, which he returned. All right, MacDonald, Sirius nodded, casually sweeping his hair behind one ear. He'd started doing that whenever there were girls around. Remus hated it. All three girls had ice creams, which looked like an excellent idea considering the unseasonably warm weather. Lily had even charmed a Chinese fan to follow her around, creating a cool breeze wherever the three girls went. Give us a lick, then, James winked at her lewdly. Marlene turned beetroot red and dissolved into giggles, but Lily remained calm, arching one eyebrow. Hmm... You do look like you need cooling off. Aquamenti. With that, she aimed her wand at the marauders and sprayed them all with icy cold water. Remus leapt out of the way, but she wasn't trying to get him anyway. James and Sirius got the worst of it and shouted in dismay as their hair and shirts were drenched. Mary, Marlene and Lily cackled with glee. What do you do that for? Sirius growled, pulling his dripping hair apart to glare at them looking like a drowned rat. Thought you lot liked practical jokes, Lily winked at him, before turning away and walking towards the lake. Complete nightmare, that one, Sirius groaned, trying a hot air charm on his hair. That's my future wife you're talking about, James replied dreamily, watching her go. His glasses had steamed up comically. Oh, stop being so dramatic. You'll dry out in half an hour in this heat. Where do you think they got the ice cream? Peter asked distantly. Remus smiled, lying back again. Never mind going home, or betrothals, or new subjects. For now, everything was just as it should be. Chapter 38, Second Year The Long Last Day, Part 1 Friday the 29th of June, 1973 Remus was running late, and there was still so much left to do. As usual, he had slept later than the rest of the marauders, and by the time he woke up, Peter was the only one left, scurrying out of the door with a quick, Morning, Lupin. Good luck. Checking the clock, Remus had leapt out of bed and run for the shower in a state of panic. As he combed his hair in the mirror, thinking glumly that this might be the last time, 
as Matron was sure to shave him bald as soon as he was back at St Edmund's tomorrow. He ran through the list in his head. Breakfast first, of course, couldn't miss that. If he got a move on, then he might just catch James and Peter before they set off on their own missions. It would likely be his only chance to see them, because today, the very last day of term, the usually united marauders would be conspicuously separated until the feast. After breakfast, he would have to run back upstairs to pack. Remus was quite sure that they would have a detention coming their way that evening, and he might not have enough time the next morning before they had to catch the train. Once he'd packed, he needed to return his library books. This filled him with a sense of guilt. He still hadn't found anything to help Sirius, despite weeks of research. Their only hope now was that the Black Cousins would be able to find a way out of the engagement after the betrothal ceremony had taken place. On his way to the library, he'd been able to drop off his subject applications form at McGonagall's office. He'd put that off far too long already. Then, books returned and form handed in, Remus thought he should have ample time to meet Peter outside the greenhouses at eleven o'clock, where he would collect the invisibility cloak. As long as everything went like clockwork, Remus should then be able to get the umbrellas he needed from the gamekeeper's shed on the grounds and smuggle them back into their dorm room. Then, it would be about lunchtime. Remus was hoping to use that hour to finish reading his book in peace. He'd borrowed it from Sirius, and only had a chapter left, so he really wanted that out of the way before they had to go home. Especially as he sincerely doubted that McGonagall would allow him to read during his inevitable detention that evening. Shortly after lunch, then the first stage of the Marauder's end-of-term plan would come into effect. He would avoid the mayhem and double-checked he'd packed everything, possibly doing a bit of Sirius's packing too, because the other boy still hadn't done it and Remus suspected he was leaving it until the last minute. Then the preparations for the feast would begin. All he had to do was show up early enough to help James and Sirius with the final incantations. This was provided, of course, that none of them got caught beforehand. There was a sudden knock at the bathroom door, just as Remus was pulling up his jeans. Toast out here for you, Mooney, Sirius's voice called. Thought I'd save you some time. Oh, great, cheers, Remus called back, pulling on his shirt quickly, as if Sirius might see him through the wood. Good luck, see you this afternoon. Yep, you too. Remus heard Sirius's footsteps retreat and disappear down the staircase. Well, at least that was one thing taken care of. He emerged from the steamy bathroom and saw the plate of toast sitting on his trunk. Four slices. Sirius had not been stingy, and each liberally coated with a different spread. Remus grinned and renewed his pledge to help Sirius pack later on. He spent a leisurely hour munching on the toast and collecting up various belongings which had spread themselves far and wide from his bed to his friend's shelves, even into the common room. He took the opportunity to play Hunky Dory one last time, saying a fond goodbye to the record player for a few months. The David Bowie print Sirius had given him for his birthday no longer moved, which Remus was somewhat glad for because at least that meant he could take it back to St Edmund's without arousing any suspicion. His trunk didn't seem to close as easily as it had at the end of last summer, when he'd been on his way to Hogwarts, and he had to rearrange the items several times before everything squashed inside. Remus brushed his teeth and went to gather his library books, stuffing them into his threadbare satchel. He wondered if Matron might let him have a new school bag. Mind you, The last time he'd asked for one, she'd taken the opportunity to teach him how to sew. A life skill, she'd said. He didn't bother telling her that the repairing charm worked just much better. But even that wasn't much use anymore. With his list of chosen subjects in hand, he headed down into the common room, where every other Gryffindor seemed to be doing their last-minute packing too. The usually cosy space was an uproar, with shouts pleading for the return of missing books and games, students crawling under tables and lifting sofas, hunting for long-lost items, groups of tearful seventh-year girls hugging everyone goodbye, and the owls swooping this ways and that. 
Bremus, Mary stopped him on his way out. You all by yourself? Yep, he nodded with a mischievous grin. She grinned back. Ooh, what are you lot planning? Me and Marlene were just saying how you'd been quiet for the last few weeks. Ask me no questions and I'll tell you no lies, he replied. Sorry, I've got to return my books. Lily's looking for you, she said quickly. Oh, um, I'll be in the dining hall for lunch. Bit busy till then. Tell her sorry. With that, he hurried through the portrait hall and into the corridor, which was just as busy with students rushing back and forth, saying their last-minute goodbyes. Peeves, caught up in the excitement, had obviously found out wherever Filch stored the toilet roll and was flinging wads of wet tissue at anyone who got close enough. Arms over his head, Remus scurried towards McGonagall's office, just as Peeves fired at the door. Remus ducked just in time, and Peeves flew off, laughing manically, as McGonagall, having heard the very loud splat, opened her office door. She peered down at Remus, still squatting and covering his head. Mr Lupin? It was Peeves, he stood up quickly. Honestly, Professor. I believe you. She gave a small smile. Spirits are always high on the last day of term. Have you got something for me? The old teacher glanced down at the piece of parchment he was clutching. Oh, yes. He struck out his hand. Excellent. Do come in, Lupin. Uh, but you could hardly say no to McGonagall, or ask her if it could wait until later. He wondered what on earth she wanted. Surely Sirius and James hadn't been caught already. It would be pretty obvious as soon as phase one of the plan was initiated, but he'd heard nothing. Sit down, Mr Lupin. Tea? Um, yeah, okay. He sat uneasily. McGonagall waved her wand, and the little tartan teapot on her desk began to pour its contents into two matching cups. Help yourself to milk, the professor said absent-mindedly, as she scanned the piece of parchment he'd given her. Divination, she said, muggle studies, and arithmancy. He didn't say anything. She looked up, finally surveying him over the tops of her square spectacles. Are these the same subjects Mr. Potter and Mr. Black have chosen? If I'm not much mistaken, Mr. Pettigrew too, hmm? Remus just nodded. Actually, Peter was only taking divination and muggle studies. He had found out that you only needed to select a minimum of two new subjects and had decided not to push himself any further than necessary. Remus would rather die and take on less work than James or Sirius. I am interested to know what prompted you to select Muggle studies in particular. Considering a future in the Muggle liaison office, perhaps? Uh, Remus stammered. He had no idea what the Muggle liaison office was, but it didn't sound very interesting. I would have thought you'd have sufficient knowledge of the Muggle world having spent so much of your life in it. Yeah, but, well, there's no need for you to take subjects simply because your friends are, Mr Lupin, Professor McGonagall said, more kindly than he'd expected. You'll still be taking the same core classes, after all. Rima shrugged. He hadn't known what else to do. Really, all the subjects had interested him. Okay, perhaps not Muggle Studies. She was right there. But in the end, he hadn't much liked the idea of missing out on lessons with the other marauders. One of the most wonderful things about school, Mr Lupin, McGonagall began tactfully, is the friends we make, connections and relationships that last a lifetime. I know you have made some very dear friends at Hogwarts. Remus fought a grimace. Did she have to make it sound so girly? She cleared her throat, clearly amu amused by his reaction. Some very dear friends. But school is also the place to challenge ourselves, to test our mettle. Do you understand? He nodded blankly. She sighed, sipping her tea. Your exam results were excellent this year, Remus. 
He straightened up a little at that. He was pretty chuffed with the results himself. He hadn't beat James at Transfiguration, or Snape and Lily at Potions, but in everything else, he had some of the highest marks in the class. As such, McGonagall continued, I have no concerns in permitting you to study arithmancy, which, I must tell you, is one of the most challenging courses we offer at Hogwarts. But I would question whether muggle studies is a suitable use of your time going forward. You might find it very dull, I'm afraid. Have you considered, for example, ancient runes? Remus twisted his hands in his lap. It had sounded quite interesting, but he'd spent so much time struggling to read English and catching up with the rest of the students that he'd backed away at the idea of learning another language. McGonagall seemed to understand his concerns, at least in part. You wouldn't find it as difficult as you think, you know. You're an immensely gifted scholar and a very hard worker. In addition, your fellow Gryffindors... Miss MacDonald and Miss McKinnon will be in the same class. This didn't sound too bad, actually. He was very fond of the two M's now, and it would be fun to spend a bit more time with them. How nice it would be to have a lesson in which there was no serious showing off, no Peter trying to copy his notes, and no James acting like a prat to get Lily's attention. OK, he said. I'll give it a go. Excellent. McGonagall smiled widely, looking genuinely pleased. She waved her wand over his form to amend it. Um, Professor, he asked, suddenly slightly nervous again. Yes, Lupin? I, well, I was thinking about another subject, too, that maybe, maybe instead of divination? McGonagall's smile turned wry. Well, I can't pretend I've ever seen much use in divination myself. Not unless the witch or wizard concerned is genuinely gifted in the sight. Remus nodded, assuming that this meant he was not thus gifted. I thought, maybe, I mean, it's probably silly. James has said it was silly, a girly subject. Um, care of magical creatures, he said, all in a rush. McGonagall looked genuinely surprised. Is this something which interests you? Um, yeah, I I suppose so. Not just because I'm, you know, but, yeah, I I suppose mostly because of that. Well, it's a very interesting subject. McGonagall sipped her tea again. I should say that if you're more interested in that than divination, then by all means... Great, okay, change it, he nodded, feeling a bit embarrassed, but also quite pleased with himself. McGonagall waved her wand at once. Your father was rather gifted when it came to magical creatures, you know, she said. Remus raised his eyebrows. I didn't know. Oh yes, she nodded, as if she was just passing the time of day. An expert in his field. His field? Non-human spirituous apparitions, bogarts and ghosts, you know, dementors too, all rather dark, I'm afraid. Care of magical creatures mainly focuses on corporal, that is to say, mortal creatures. But you may well share his talents. Oh, right, thanks, Professor. Remus got up quickly. He didn't have much time to think about his father now, He had so much to do. I've got to get to the library. He indicated his heavy bag, splitting at the seams. Yes, yes, quite. McGonagall nodded. Thank you, Remus. I'll see you at the feast tonight. Yeah, bye. As he finally exited McGonagall's office, Remus glanced at the clock. It was ten to eleven. Damn, no time for the library now. He had to meet Peter on the grounds, and it usually took at least fifteen minutes to get out of the castle providing none of the staircases forced you back off track. Heaving his unreasonably weighty book bag, Remus sighed and set off on his way. 
By the time he reached the greenhouses, sweating and too hot in the bright sunshine, Peter had obviously been waiting for a little while and was wringing his hands. There you are, he gasped. I thought something bad had happened. Sorry, Remus panted, wiping his forehead with his sleeve. McGonagall wanted to have a chat. Everything okay? Yep, Peter nodded, his eyes darting round. Just like James told me. Have you seen them? No. Everything should be okay then. Here, Peter handed Remus the invisibility cloak. Cheers. Oi, are you going back to the dorm? Yeah, I still need to pack. Great, mind taking my books back? I wanted to return them to the library, but McGonagall... Okay, Peter took the bag. Bloody hell, Mooney, he groaned, sagging under the weight of it. I'll see you at lunch? Probably. Good luck. Peter went scurrying back off towards the castle, leaving Remus alone again. Glancing around to make sure the coast was clear, Remus wasted no time in approaching the equipment shed. He'd been in it once before for a detention in his first year. It was much bigger on the inside than it looked, and full of various tools for maintaining the expansive Hogwarts grounds. The lock did not respond to the usual Alohomora incantation, but it absolutely did respond to a few quick twists with one of Lily Evans' hairpins. She'd given him the pin the evening before, with a quizzical look, but hadn't asked why he needed it. Once inside, Remus acted quickly, finding the large black trunk of umbrellas. He wasn't quite sure why wizards still used umbrellas. Surely there were spells for protecting yourself from the rain. But, nevertheless, they didn't want anyone summoning them and ruining their fun. Remus covered the trunk with the invisibility cloak and cast a weightlessness charm on it before levitating the whole thing out of the shed. He strolled back up to the school in a leisurely manner, trying not to look as though he was up to anything at all, hiding his wand under his robes so no one could see that it was guiding the invisible trunk. He took a good half an hour to navigate himself and the trunk through the castle unnoticed, and without bumping into any other students. Several times he had to levitate the thing over his own head, which took a lot of effort and concentration. Still, he did it, reaching his destination with an enormous sense of achievement. He left the trunk in the dorm room and performed a sticking charm on the lock. If anyone did try to summon it, they hopefully wouldn't be able to get it open in time to save themselves. He folded the cloak neatly and left it on James's pillow. Peter had dropped Remus's book bag at the foot of his bed, and Remus sighed to himself, realising that he would have to return the books before he could go for lunch. Hoisting it onto his back, he once more descended the staircase into the Gryffindor common room. Once again, he was waylaid, this time by Lily, who looked extremely flustered and extremely pleased to see him. "'There you are!' she shrieked, grabbing his shoulders. "'I've been looking for you everywhere!' Hiya, Lily, he smiled politely. Sorry, can it wait? I've got to get to the... Absolutely not, she shook her head vehemently. Can we go up to your room? The others aren't there, are they? No, he sighed. He could go to the library later, if he skipped trying to finish his book, or if his visit to Madame Pomfrey didn't take too long. He followed Lily back up the stairs. Do I want to know what that is? she said, glancing at the big black trunk. It's a trunk full of umbrellas, he said promptly. She raised an eyebrow, but didn't question him further. I've got something for you. She put down her bag on the top of the trunk, rifling through it. She withdrew a very strange item. It looked like a sheet of clear plastic. Remus furrowed his brow as she handed it to him. He turned it over. Um, Lily? I'm sorry it took me so long. I had to wait ages for the acetate. My mum got it from a friend of hers who's a teacher. They use them for overhead projectors in muggle schools. Well, you know that, obviously. Remus nodded blankly. There had been an OHP at St Edmunds, but it had needed its light bulb replacing about three years ago, and as far as he knew, no one had got round to doing it. Got a book? Lily nodded at his bag. Get one out, I'll show you. He complied, curious to see where this was going. 
She opened the text at a random page, placed it on the trunk, then lay the acetate over it. Look, she said. Remus looked, about to withdraw his wand in case she wanted him to read something. She shook her head, pushing his hand away. Just look, she said. He looked again, rubbing his neck. There are three key elements to performing a successful unbreakable vow. In the first instance... What? Remus exclaimed, picking up the book and staring. Did it work? Lily looked at him eagerly. Can you read it? I... Yeah, I... Bloody hell, Evans. He flipped the page again, replacing the acetate. It worked. It was much less fiddly than Sirius's spell. It should work outside of Hogwarts, too, she said, her green eyes sparkling. I fiddled about with the incantation a bit, and there was some potion work involved, but it should last a good long time. You're amazing, Rumor said, still reading. Thank you so much. Quite out of the blue, Lily leapt at Remus, flinging her arms around his neck and hugging him. Taken a bit by surprise, Remus felt himself blushing. He'd never been hugged very often before, let alone by a girl. She was soft, and her hair smelt nice, like apples. I wanted to do it in time for your birthday, she said, stepping back, still smiling. But I kept messing it up. Thank goodness it worked. You'd have thought I was mental if it hadn't. Yeah, he laughed nervously, still recovering from the surprise embrace. Thank you, Lily. This is such an amazing thing. You deserve it, Remus, she said earnestly. Honestly, you work so bloody hard, and you keep up with Potter and Black. Remus shrugged. There was a slight awkward silence. Look, I'll let you get on, Lily said finally. Sorry I waylaid you like that. See you at the feast? Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Remus looked down at the book. Oh shit, wait. Evans, have you got an umbrella? Uh, I think so. I might have packed it already. Unpack it, he said firmly. And take it to the feast, okay? Okay. Once she had left, Remus allowed himself a moment to sit down. He couldn't believe she'd done it. He couldn't believe he hadn't thought of it. It was so simple, so elegant. He'd be able to read all summer. He flipped to another page. It is important to note that the unbreakable vow, once made, cannot be superseded by any other kind of vow, oath or promise made thereafter, regardless of any legal or moral concerns around keeping such a vow. It is therefore pivotal that... Oh! Remus gasped suddenly. It was as if there was a click in his brain. Everything had fallen into place. Oh! He leapt up. The library would just have to be put off. Just a little while longer. It was at times like these, Remus thought as he paced up and down the dark corridor, that he could really do with the completed Marauder's map. Unfortunately, they had only so far managed to map three quarters of the castle. They were a long way off tagging every student yet. Remus had been waiting outside the Slytherin common room for twenty minutes now, with no luck at all. The green-robed students who passed him ignored his pleas for help, and even the bloody baron had carried on his way with a disdainful sniff. It was getting hopeless. He would miss lunch at this rate. He looked at the nearest clock. It was half past twelve. Phase one of the plan was imminent. When the common room wall opened once more, his heart sank even further. Well, 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 Snape smirked. You said there was a mad Gryffindor on the loose, but I didn't think it would be you, loony lupin. Remus sighed. Piss off, Snivellus. Don't be so rude, Snape raised his wand. I ought to wash your mouth out with soap. I didn't think you knew how to wash, Remus replied dryly. Why, you... Can we not? Remus said irritably. It's the last day of term, and there's plenty of stuff I'd rather be doing. Can you just, oh, I don't know, let me in or something? Let you in? Snape's black eyes shone in amusement. Why on earth would I let you in? I need to speak to... 
out of the way, Snape, you slimy git. A voice came from the wall behind Severus. Barty Crouch Jr. stepped out, followed by Regulus. Remus felt a small measure of relief. Regulus, can you get Narcissa for me? Mordio! Without warning, Crouch aimed a curse at Remus, who dodged it just in time, pulling out his own wand. Expelli, he started, but it was too late. Crouch cursed him a second time, and pain rocketed through Remus's skull, his head ringing. It was awful, but he didn't flinch. It only hurt for a while, and he knew pain like an old friend. If they thought that something as commonplace as that would stop him, they had another thing coming. What do you want, half-blood? Crouch asked, grinning madly. Or are you just thick, hanging around here all alone? He is thick, Severus said, as two short planks. Shut up, Snape, Crouch said, turning his wand on Severus now. Remus narrowed his eyes, paying attention. Apparently, Snape was bad at making friends wherever he went. Shut up, both of you, Regulus finally spoke, sounding bored. He had been watching Remus's face the whole time. What do you want, Lupin? Better tell me before Barty fancies practising one of his unforgivables on you. I need to speak to Narcissa, Remus said, very clearly and as calmly as he could. It's urgent. It's about, you know, black family stuff. Regulus watched him for a few moments longer, not speaking. He was so like Sirius, only without any of the joy or humour. If Remus hadn't known better, he'd have said Regulus was the elder brother. Snape, go and get my cousin, will you? He said sharply, not even moving his head. Snape looked furious, but he obeyed. Did everyone do what the blacks told them to? James often teased Sirius for acting as though he was royalty, but perhaps he was just playing the role he'd been raised for. Crouch soon grew bored and wandered off, leaving Regulus and Remus still facing each other in a stony silence. Remus was actually glad to see Narcissa's sour face when she finally came through the wall. Oh, Merlin, she sighed, staring down at Remus. What now? I figured it out, he said quickly. The the problem. I've got a solution. Oh, yes? She folded her arms, looking unconvinced. The unbreakable vow, he hurried, keen to get it all out so he could go. It can't be broken. Ever. She snorted. Yes, that's certainly implied. Remus rolled his eyes impatiently. I mean, he said more slowly, his bravery mounting, that if you've made an unbreakable vow, then you can't make another promise to go against it. You can't even be forced to make other promises. Or vows. He stressed the last word meaningfully. The light switched on in Narcissa's eyes almost immediately. For a second, her pretty pink lips formed the same O that Remus had made only hours ago. She did not have the time to speak, however, because in the same moment there was a shriek from somewhere up the hall, causing them all to turn. A slithering girl came bursting out of a girl's bathroom at the end of the corridor, wailing. They all just exploded, she said, looking faintly disturbed. Sure enough, they could see through the swinging toilet door behind her that waves of pink foam were spilling from the wash basins and toilets. It was truly magnificent. Gorgeous great drips of soft, soapy bubbles tumbled out of every tap and drain. I, um, I have to go, Remus grinned, winking at Narcissa, then breaking into a run. End of chapter 38